Coming around.
consists of a beginning, a middle, and an end. His point was that a well-constructed story causes established, a well-constructed story causes established in the beginning of the story give rise to effects in the middle of the story, and those effects give rise to further outcomes at the end. So when, so basically when you're looking at a story, often in the beginning, kind of all the stuff that's going to unfold throughout the story can find its seeds in the beginning. And that's very true of the, the beginning of the Bible. When you are, if you're familiar with the Word of God, when you're in the first stories, you just start seeing all kinds of other stories hidden away in all the imagery and items and things unfolding. You, you cannot help but hear echoes of things. <clears throat> So I, I love that Aristotle captured that. You're a good storyteller if you can do that. You know, can you get stuff in the beginning? Can you figure things out? My wife is wonderful at figuring things out way before I do. She's not so good at keeping that secret. <laughs> so we're working, we work on that together. Because <laughs> she figures that things out before I do, often. In movies, yes. <laughs> Then she always asks me questions of things that I have no answer to because I'm watching the story too. You know, I don't know. They haven't shown us that. Her brain is somewhere else than my man brain. The Bible tells a story, the two. It's a grand narrative, and the story that all stories in some manner are trying to tell or retelling, or they're trying not to tell that story. It's the big story that your unique story fits within. In truth, to find God, purpose, value, and meaning in your life, you must be shown how your story in your life fits into what God's doing. You're the, it's a puzzle piece that makes so much sense of things when you find it. As we read through the scriptures, we are continually, continually looking for the lower story 
and the upper story. And this is a, this is a way that they language they're using in some of the material of the story. This idea that there's always this lower story that's happening, all the stuff that's happening with your life and my life, right? All the events and crazy things going on. And there's this upper story that God's story is unfolding. And somehow in his miraculous way, he adds all these details down here into all the details up here and makes sense of it and works it all through the counsel of his will to accomplish what he wants. It's a masterful piece of artistry that's for us down here sometimes hard to see. We're very familiar with the lower story, what's happening, what's not happening, the pain, the suffering, the difficulties. It's harder to sometimes see the upper story, like what's God doing in all of this stuff? Right. And this is something that, that we're, we're attempting to do as we read through scripture. We're going to get all kinds of lower story weirdness and oddities and scariness and surprises and beauty. And when you encounter each little thing on the lower story, it's kind of like, oh, oh, oh. But then as you move through scripture, you start seeing there's an upper story that's got meaning and purpose that uses all this stuff in some way or capacity. But let's be honest, sometimes when you're reading through the Bible, you run up to stories and you're kind of like, you crash into them. Just like in your life where you've gone through some stuff and it's like, how does this fit? Where's God in this? Why did I do this? Why did they do that? That's wrong. That's beautiful, right? And that mesh of those two things is, is how you grow mature as a Christian when, when you discern how to understand the lower story and the upper story and you trust God in the midst of it. But it's not easy. <clears throat> At least it's not for me. Probably is for you. Trying to understand what God is doing in individuals and communities' lives and what is unfolding in his eternal purposes is difficult. But what we see on this side of eternity is far more complicated and confusing at times than what is seen from the other side of eternity. And like last week, nothing reveals this more than the cross, right? The cross of Jesus seen from, from time looks horrific, terrible, judgment, sacrifice, blood, abuse. It's violent. It's, it's horrific. It's heart-wrenching. But from the side of eternity, it's the salvation of the world. It's the salvation of you and me. It's God's purposes being unfolded through something that from this side looks horrific, but from this side, it doesn't ignore the horror, but sees the purpose. It's good to be able to see things from heavenly perspectives. It makes life on this side, it equips you better to move through it. <clears throat> we, have the we have the challenge of properly understanding our own chapters in this big story. There's a chapter in chapter 11 of C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicle books, the, the Horse and the Boy, that captures this tension. Bring up Shasta and Bree. <clears throat> this is from chapter 11. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions, said Shasta. Shasta's the boy. There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I just told you there were at least two. The first night and... No, there were only one. But he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gapped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with avarice. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death so that it came to shore where a man sat wakeful at midnight to receive you. Then it was you who wounded Erebus. It was I. But what for? Child, said the voice, I'm telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said something similar to Peter in John. Let's bring up the next slide, John 2. Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. Very... Truly, I tell you, when you were, this isn't John 2, this is John 21, 17, sorry. 
Feed my sheep, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me, Peter, or follow me. And Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? This is John. And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? <laughs> and Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. You have your story. John has his story. And I'm working through all of them. Even I'll be working through that season of your life where everything starts going to a direction you don't actually want to go, but are taken. You have to trust me that I'm still the author of your story. How many of you are old and can feel that life often doesn't take you in the direction that you want to go? And you wonder, who's in control of this? <laughs> Picture of creation. <clears throat> Following Jesus means we need to discern his will for our lives. We become more and more adept at such an ability by becoming students of the story, the word of God. We immerse ourselves in the stories within the story. All of them, the boring and the beautiful, the horrific and the hopeful, the gross and the glorious ones. We search in the small corners and behind grand themes, in dark shadows, this is all in the word of God, in the dark shadows and along the high precipices, in treacherous ravines, in palaces, in stables. Our minds and hearts are captured and confounded by the mystery of seers and their frightening dreams and visions. We dive after prodigals into the mouth of the dragons in the deep. We ascend to search under angels' wings and wander on lakes of glass and fire. We listen to demons who argue with Jesus and taste the fruit on the lips of lovers in locked away gardens of delight. We wail with the wounded on bloody battlefields. We pace in the darkness in the dens of beasts and are shocked and anxious watching dancers scheme in front of compromising kings. All the elements of life find their way into the story. Bread, water, longing, lust, singing, weeping, sandals, cloaks, books, candles, cakes, and crowns, daggers and rings and dove-like eyes, passions and poems and commitments, tables and doorways and monsters and maniacs and princes and warlords, treasures of gold, ominous gallows, crushed skulls, Edible angel dew scattered over the ground. We are shaken by the blasting siege trumpets and feel depression lift as the psalmist sings. We're tempted before bathtubs on rooftops and struck dumb with the wonder at the empty graves of the awakened dead. We hear whispers in the wind, behold flames on heads, and visit dinner parties with unlikely and unwelcome guests. We watch thievery from Jesus' wallet and marvel at a rich man who pays a stranger's medical bills in all all of these pages, through all of these symphonies, we become a people of the story and we remember and in remembering, we encounter. That's the power of this story, this God-breathed story. In Lewis's uh, book, uh, The Silver Chair, let's bring up the picture of Jill and Aslan. Aslan says something similar to Jill. He says, <clears throat> but long before she, had, it says, before long she got near the edge, the voice behind her said, stand still in a moment, I will blow. <clears throat> but first, remember. Remember. Remember the signs. Say them to yourself when you wake in the morning. When you lie down at night, when you wake in the middle of the night, 
And whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from following the signs. And secondly, I'm going to give you a warning. Here on the mountain, I've spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That is why it's so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. Remember the signs and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. Now, if you've read the story, you know there were only four signs and she messes up three of them. <laughs> and the one last sign at the very end, thankfully, the story unfolds in a good way because Puddle Gum figures it out. But that's the beauty of walking with God, right? Even when we mess up the story, even when we forget the signs, even when we uh, are one of those characters in all of those events in the Bible, God's still working out his plan. But you need to remember something. When you're here and you're hearing the word of God, when you're in worship, the air is clear, right? Your mind is clear. You remember who you are. You remember who he is. You're remembering the word. It's, you're in that Aslan's country, as it were. You're in the fresh air of the spirit and kingdom of heaven. Everything's clear right here. But man, when you walk out the door and you start arguing about who or where you're going to go to eat, and you go down, down, down to Narnia. It's easy to get confused and forget. Right? As we read through chapter 2 in the story, we encountered, these are some of the things I wrote down, a tree, a field, a cave, a well, stars, sand, a sacrifice, an only son carrying wood on his back, a ram caught in a thicket, an offering, a promise, a birthright, a meal, a blessing, a betrayal of brothers, a reconciliation, and a land of promise. To one familiar with the story of Scripture, these elements become echoes of other parts of the story as well. As we listen to Scripture, it becomes a song, and the song of that story, and we hear it being sung throughout the Bible. We encounter other only sons, other sons wearing carrying wood upon their back. Other sacrifices. We encounter sons that betray and brothers that betray and kisses that betray. Reconciliation. You just start moving throughout Scripture. You start seeing the same notes of the song. You start hearing the same song in other places. That's the beauty and the depth and the majesty of God's Word. As this story finds a place in your home, in, uh, a place uh, finds a home in your heart and mind, we pick up on notes and stanzas that are woven throughout the song of Scripture. Like choruses, we return to themes that over and over teach us something true. These songs become our voice in the journey of life. So when you're moving through Scripture, it's like when you hear a song in a similar note, similar stanzas, similar choruses, and you realize throughout Scripture in this symphony of song, that it returns to certain themes over and over again. It's like the choruses of eternity that have something powerful to say that are going to echo through many chapters and years in Scripture. And the more you become aware of the song and the words and the notes, you pick this up as you read Scripture. You hear Christ. You see Christ. You encounter Christ. He's the angel of the Lord at Abraham's tent. He speaks to you. You see him throughout the pageantry of scripture and can hear his voice in other voices, see his work in other workings, see his rescue in great deliverances. Christ becomes greater. The lion, as it were, is seen in all of the other elements. He's the cat and the salvation and the rescue, right? And that's Jesus in the final days with his disciples who says, Moses spoke of me. I'm through the whole scripture. He's the lion that was always there. And he's always been there in your life. Through every chapter, every moment, every scene and every unseen thing, he's pushing the story forward. Is that good news for anybody in the midst of a hard time maybe? These songs, they give us light. 
They warm us within like fire. They heal our broken places. They feed and nourish us. Scripture and this story and this song slake our thirst, awaken us from slumber, quicken our pace, quench our dangerous smolderings and protect us from devils and deceptions and distractions and deadly detours. The song of the story becomes our greatest defense and offense. It becomes a sword of the spirit unsheathed in our mouths. And the more you become familiar with the story, the more you're in the story, the more the story makes its way in you, it becomes your prayer. You begin to pray scripture, sing scripture, meditate on scripture, encourage yourself with scripture, share scripture, read scripture, write scripture, quote scripture. Scripture becomes air and breath and spirit. It inhabits you. It breathes its life into you and breathes out of you. It nourishes and strengthens you. And it becomes a weapon against doubts and fears and anxieties and lies and deceptions and illusions. This is wonderfully captured in a, in a new story I'm reading. It was C.S. one of C.S. Lewis's mentors, uh, literary, literary mentors, George MacDonald. And he has a story called The Princess and the Goblin. And there's a portion in the story where the boy character in the story teaches us how to... Uh, drive goblins away. I don't know if you read that. Anybody read The Princess and the Goblin? Real high. Let me see. Anybody who's read Princess and Goblin? Why? What's this? Are you ashamed of reading? Who read it? One, two, three, four, five of us. Look, a wonderful thing you discovered today. You've got a new book you can read as an adult or with your children. It's a great story. I'm loving it. In this story, though, I learned, and I didn't know this, how to get rid of goblins. Jace, are you listening? This is how you're gonna get rid of goblins, all right? So listen up. Curdy, the boy in the story, tells you how to do this. He said this, as I have indicated already, the chief defense against the goblins is verse. Words, poems, songs. They hate verse of every kind. And some kinds they cannot endure at all. I suspect that they could not make any themselves. And that is why they dislike it so much. At all events, those who are the most afraid of them, those who are most afraid of goblins, are those who can neither make verses themselves nor remember the verses that other people have made for them. The people who are frightened most by goblins are those who can't make verse or remember verse. And while those who are never afraid were those who could make verses for themselves, for although they were certain old rhymes which were very effectual, yet it was well known that a new rhyme, if of the right sort, was even more distasteful to goblins and therefore more effectual in putting them to flight. Now this is just straight out of Scripture in Ephesians what does it say? Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Why? Because it's a weapon. It's a powerful, powerful tool against goblins and devils and delusions and deceptions and all the things that try to defeat you in your mind and in your spirit and in your heart and in your home. Sing the ones we know, the ones that have written, and even sing a new song, one from the Spirit. The Spirit wants to sing through you. If you are overcome, overwhelmed, and frightened, of all the goblins that are constantly, as in the story, creeping up to your window or trying to get into the house, you need to sing verse. Scripture, in poetry, in music, in song, in instrument. We are a warring, singing people. And our weapon is the word. It's verse. Amen?
Now you know how to fight goblins. In the stories that we read this week is one of the hardest stories in the Bible for most, and the one I want to close with. Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. I loved this picture because it makes Isaac older because there's another story coming down the road that's going to have an older son in it whose father also offers up his son to die. And so I love this painting because it captures those two stories in the midst of it. But let's be real. When it's a young child in the arms of Abraham, everyone gets very troubled about moving through this passage. <clears throat> in, G in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 2, I think it's up there, it says, Sometimes later, sometime later God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he says, Here I am. God said to him, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, that's where the temple will eventually be built upon, the same place, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. This is a shocking tale. How can a good God ask such a thing? Why do we have such a hard time with this story? Where does our moral objection to this come from? If God is good, how do we determine he's good? By what standard do we discern what is good and what is bad? What happens when we are brought to some moment where we don't know what is right or wrong in the way ahead or in a choice? What do we do if the way forward in obedience and faith seems to contradict our understanding or experience maybe even of God who says to go in that direction? What if we're tested? A testing place is difficult, right? You don't always know the answers. Some of you think you know all the answers, but you're going to get a test where the, the answer is very difficult to fill in the blank. Fundamentally, the scripture stories reveal people building their lives on a bedrock of trusting God. Trust in who God is and who he says he will be is the foundation for living in faith. Trusting God. Trust. Trust is the heart of walking in faith. Trust is the heart of spiritual growth. Building your life with a sense of trust is, is profoundly challenging and profoundly important. Professor Timothy Larson, who is uh, the professor of Christian thought at Wheaton College, and author of George MacDonald in the Age of Miracles, Incarnation, Doubt, and Reenchantment, which is on my list to buy. He said in this book, the primary Christian teaching of the story is that one must learn to have faith. If you know that someone is trustworthy, then you should lean towards the side of believing them, even when what they're saying sounds like nonsense to you. This is hard. Trusting when it's hard to trust. You know, this is interesting. There's two gardens in the Garden of Eden. One was a tree of life that if you ate from, you'd live forever. And one was a tree that God said you're not supposed to eat from. And it was the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. And you say to yourself, well, what's wrong with good? Why would God not want me to eat something that would help me understand the difference between good and bad? Because you're going to come to a moment in your life where trusting God is going to go against, in some ways, what your mind and your affections and your emotions might want you to do. You will think in different times in your life, this is what's good. And you'll want to lean in your own understanding and trust that you think you know what's good. And yet God's word or something else is going to contradict that. And you're in a battle then between will you listen to what life says and what God's tree says? Or will you listen to this other tree that says this is what's good. This is what's bad. This is how you order your life. And our world is full of people who are at this tree determining what is good and bad all over. Our culture is mad right now with what they say is bad and what they say is good. They're consuming 
seeing things at an alarming rate to where they, in their own illusions and delusions, can't tell what reality is. They've eaten so much from this tree. They think up is down and down is up. Girl is boy and boy is girl. Good is bad and bad is good. You cannot get out of the hellish quicksand and whirlpool with how fast this culture is consuming the fruit of this tree. And if you were trained to use your own understanding, your own flesh, your own background, your own ways of thinking to determine what God's will is, you're going to run into moments in your life where God's saying one thing and it contradicts maybe even the desires of your own heart. Faith will challenge you to step somewhere where the natural world says you can't walk here. And Jesus calls you out on it. And everything in your mind says, stay in the boat, stay in the boat, stay where it's safe, stay where it's reasonable, stay where it's logical. And in some moment, God's calling you somewhere where it's not. And the question will be to you as it was to Abraham, will you obey when what you think is good and following me are at odds? Most of us, if I'm honest, I think we fail these tests. We don't know how to trust when we're not in agreement with what the authority says to do. We're great at submission when we agree, really bad at it when we don't agree. We want to be all accountable to one another when we want to be accountable. But then when we don't, we're not. This is a strange thing, and this story pokes at it. This is the first man in the scripture who doesn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He sets aside what he thinks is good and right and obeys. And it's shocking. It's so shocking, we turn the page quick. We can't, we can't even contemplate how a father gives his son up. It's so uncomfortable. We, we, we skip over the New Testament stuff real easy. You know, God gives up Jesus to sacrifice because there's this willingness and thing. You know, it's like, but whoa, 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 whoa. Let's get back to the story. It's still at its base really odd and difficult. Can you be saved by another one giving up their life? That concept, let's not run away from it. It's odd in Christianity. Someone needs to die for you? Huh? The natural mind doesn't want to accept that. We can, we can abort two million children a year, my choice, my body, all this stuff, and, and have no problems with ending life there. But when it comes down to Abraham daring to put Isaac on the altar, all of a sudden we become moral superiors and we're like, wrong dude. Our morality is confusing. That's my point. And this is what I'm trying to show you, that the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, it's a confusing, illusional, uh, difficult place to hang around. If you go to that tree with your friendships and your entertainment and everything, they're going to start telling you things. And you're going to hear whisperings all over this tree. Hear this. You want that. This will open your eyes. This will help you see who you really are. If you eat from this tree, your true identity will be recognized. You'll be like God. In other words, you'll be able to determine for yourself what is your truth. These are the things that whisper all around this tree and lives are being consumed at a shocking rate. <clears throat> anybody, anybody familiar with this world I'm talking about or am I talking to myself? I'm past 19 minutes. If God is good, we can trust him, even when we don't understand what is good going on in our lives, or even when the evidence before our eyes seems to convict God instead of build confidence in him. Ever been there? This doesn't seem to produce in me trust. It, it makes me go, are you good? You got you to imagine Abraham must have been somewhere in there on moments. <clears throat> It's funny, in um, C.S. Lewis, he, he, for such young children, he tackles some of this. Let's bring up the next slide, I think. The beavers. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a conversation going on with the beavers. And one of the children, I think it's um, Susan or, no, it's probably Lucy, I think, says, 
uh, in this conversation, they're having a conversation with you, and he says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, here it is. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said the beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He is the king, I tell you. The next one in the silver chair, uh, there's a moment with Jill and Aslan. <clears throat> and it goes, will you promise not to, Jill says this, will you, when she first encounters life, will you, for, will you promise to not do anything to me if I come close? I will make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty, she was by a river where the lion was. She was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. He says, I have swallowed up girls and boys and women and men and kings and emperors. And cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this, it, notice she says, it didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor, af, nor as if it was angry, it just said it. When we meet, when we read the Mount Moriah events, we see stories within stories because we can read backwards, and the characters in the stories, though, had to live them forwards. We can see that both Isaac and Jesus are the long-awaited beloved sons who are born by miraculous circumstances. Both sons had to carry wood that is to be the instrument of their deaths on their backs. In both stories, the father leads the son up a mountain, and the son follows obediently towards his own death. And in both scenarios, God provides the sacrificial substitute, which Abraham says will be a ram, a male lamb, and the New Testament authors said Jesus was the Lamb of God. Abraham's actions show us how to eat from the tree of life instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, an example of hu a human choosing to not do what is good or bad in his own eyes, but choosing to do what God says to do is the shocking, shocking encounter of that story. Let's bring up Ephesians here. Paul echoes this in Ephesians 8, 32, looking back at Abraham, he says, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let me ask you this one question today. What is God asking from you right now that you're refusing to give him, knowing, though, that all the stories say it's really the action that's going to unleash God's blessings? into your life, but you're holding on to something. We're like Abraham wrestling with yes or no to what we'll let go. We're going through this time in our family, me and Liella. My, my, my storyline is Liella's like Sarah in the story. Abraham had two sons, remember? One was Ishmael, but Sarah and the white or the mother of Ishmael got in a tizzy, and eventually Sarah said, uh, Ishmael needs to move out, and same with his mother, and you need to have him go. And Abraham's like, But Ishmael's my son, yeah, but I don't want him living here. So he's wrestling with the issue, and then God tells him, Listen to Sarah, send the son and, and the mother. So he packs her up with a canteen of water and some snacks and sends her off into the desert. And she stumbles through there and it almost dies. God rescues her in there, and this is a great story. But then God comes to Abraham and says, um, we're not done. First son's gone. Now I want you to offer me your other son. Poor folks have been waiting 25 years for kids, and God's taken them all away. 
What a strange place to be. You've worked and got all the way up to this great place where everything's what you want. It's all aligned. It's secure. When you have kids and you're 100 years old and 90 years old and you're wondering like what the uh, you know retirement's going to be like when you have no kids and all of a sudden kids start popping up and you've got them to take care of you and everything's going to be okay, it's pretty, you kind of go, oh, it's all worked out. We're safe. There's that word. We're safe. And then all of a sudden God says, hmm. I want that one to move out and I want this one you to give to me. And then all of a sudden we're back into that place where in our hearts, what are we trusting in? Are we trusting in God? Or are we trusting in what we can produce and what we can accomplish and what we can call it safe? For us, it came out into me and Liela making a decision that she was going to quit her work and come to join me in ministry in the church like we originally intended back in uh, 2006. But we were raising four kids and things got tight and planning a church and finances and all that kind of stuff, it was hard. And so we made a determination that one of us would always be with the kids, but we're gonna tag team on trying to get enough money to figure out how to raise this family. Well, now the kids are all gone and they haven't moved back. <laughs> and uh, we're left going, okay, well, we don't need to do that anymore. Well, but what about retirement? What about old age? What about doctors? What about bodies? What about, what about, what about $75,000 a year doesn't get let go of easy? But it's not about that stuff. It's about what is God saying to do? Where is God calling you to go? What kind of life has God called you to live? And what is your story supposed to be? And in your story, I tell you this, there will be times where God comes and asks for Isaac. Ask for Ishmael, ask for Isaac. And there'll be the question on whether or not you're willing to let go of things that have made your life safe. Because at the core of it, safety is about trust. And the question ultimately is, do you trust God or is your trust in something else? Money? This has been my test. Now, when I came to plant this church, I'm being very personal. Don't use any of these stories against me like you ugly devils do sometimes. I wish it weren't so, but I'm being real. When I planted this church, I was coming from a church that wasn't paying us. Um, a livable wage. So in some ways, it was kind of like stepping up. It was like, we're going to get a salary. All the good people that helped plant this church was like, you're going to be able to have a salary here, not an offering and who knows how much it comes and how much you're going to get kind of scenario, which was part of my, it was just an unstable, unknown world. God was faithful, but it was difficult. But it was nice to come to this church, new church. I'm the senior pastor. We can do things the way we want to do. We're going to plant a church. People are going to pay the bill somehow. I don't know how we're going to start a church in this room. I hope people would come and eat central. It was a ridiculous endeavor, but God did it. But for me, it was a full of adventure and, and excitement. I had nothing to lose other than, you know, four kids and a wife and all kinds of stuff. But, but in my mind, in my mind, I was full of faith. It was easy in my head to go and do it. Not as easy for her, not as easy for my kids. At this juncture, the question isn't about faith. The question is about love. And love, oh, it's, it's bigger than faith. And you know what? It's harder than faith. It's one thing to say, I'm going to do this in faith, and I believe God's going to come through. It's another thing to say, I don't know how this is actually going to work, and it seems completely ridiculous and contrary to everything in my brain, and in my heart, I'm scared to death, but because I love you, this is right. Love is very more difficult than faith. Faith is usually about you. Love is supposed to be about others. Can you get to a place where you let go of something or you say goodbye to something because of the one you love? Abraham had to say it to Sarah and he had to say it to the Lord. It's interesting because Jesus in his John 8, let's bring this one up. 
Jesus, in his one of his arguments with the Jews, he, he leans into Abraham's story and tells us something that's really strange. He says to the guys that were arguing with him, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Hmm. Somewhere in Abraham's life, he saw in the stories of his life something beyond him. That God had an upper story that was bigger than the lower story. And somehow in the midst of that, he found joy to trust the upper story when the lower story was so hard. And you know what? That faith and trust helped him to do some things that are hard to even comprehend in our mind to let go of. How do you let go of everything you love dearly for love? Jesus said he rejoices some my day. And they're like, you're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And at this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself. And like another son, slipped away from the whole event unscathed. Another son did not die when everything looked like it was going to kill him. And somehow Jesus grabs this all back to Abraham, pulls out of Abraham's heart something. And it's the thing that I've wrestled with this week as I've been in this story. What is God calling me to let go of? How am I viewing things? What am I wrestling with? What do I have faith for? What do I have love for? When the fears and the doubts and all the stuff come at me, you know, this is the most unhealthy you've been in the season of your life. Doctors are you're going to all the time. What are you going to do in the future? When those things come, where do I turn? You know, I'm going up Mount Moriah, the mountain of sacrifice. I'm wrestling through this stuff personally. Can I find joy in it? Can I see the upper story and live in the upper story when the lower story is challenging. I can because by God's grace, I'm a man of the story. And these stories shape my heart and mind. These stories help me walk. They help me face things. They help me make decisions. They help me to choose love. They help me to walk in faith. They help me to ultimately, the most important thing, trust. That's why we're in this story so much. Last of all, in the very last page of the book of Chronicles of Narnia, when they're all higher and deeper in to Aslan's country, it says this. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can mostly true, we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and when in, in which each chapter is better than the one before.